Thank you very much. Uh, shalom, marhaba, uh, and welcome, ahlan um, usahlan. We um, um, actually celebrating these days four years of the beginning of the normalization process that was launched in 2020, when in June 2020, Israel was stunned, and I think that the whole region was stunned, uh, by the depth of the relations uh, that uh, were discovered, uncovered uh, at the time. And uh, soon we saw Israeli planes landing in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. They still are, which I think is an accomplishment uh, for our difficult times. And uh, also we saw a very interesting uh, development in the polls, uh, in Israeli newspapers. You saw then when Israelis were confronted with the question of whether they will prefer the annexation of the Jordan Valley, which was at the time, if you remember, prior to the normalization uh, with the uh, UAE, Bahrain, and later Morocco as well, uh, or they prefer the good and sound relationship with the Arab world. I have to remind everyone that overwhelming 82% said that they support their relationship with the wider Middle East, specifically with the UAE, Bahrain, and Morocco at the time, to the process of annexation. We celebrated this achievement, but now it seems that four years later, we are in a very different place. It is indeed a new Middle East, but not the one of our dreams, a more uh, a Middle East of our nightmares. So, uh, Yal, uh, Abdallah, Robert, and uh, Abdelaziz, I would ask you to very briefly uh, to talk about the situation, you know, is the spirit of normalization uh, as uh, we witnessed it for the last four years, is it dead? because of what happened on 107 and because of the war uh, in Gaza? And if not, uh, what are the possible uh, uh, developments that can spin out of uh, uh, these uh, relations between Israel and the Arab world for the sake of stabilization in our region? Abdallah, I would like to start with you, please. Abdallah Junaid. Well, uh, Kesina, I don't think the Ibrahimic Accords are at a danger. And uh, at the same time, it is our failure if we gonna look further or again to the United States to support any initiative or let's say uh, 2.0 sort of a new approach. What we need at the present time is for the region to start taking stock of its own responsibility as a region to what we can do and what happened or what took place in 2020 wasn't normalization. It was a normal process that the region needed to take a step toward creating a seamless Middle East. Now, everybody wants to talk about probably uh, the day after, Gaza the day after. I believe we need to talk about the Middle East the day after. What we need to do as well is, is uh, Saudi recognition of Israel going to be the, uh, you know, the jewel of the, of the crown? I don't think so, because then we're going to be facing another problem. If that does happen, uh, what, what would be uh, Israel's position? It's, it definitely, it can't be part of the Arab League. So we need to create something that will permanently make sure that the Abrahamic Accords is growing indigenously by its own device and its own regional will, then we are going to start thinking about probably instead of this or that, let's talk about a Middle East Cooperation Council where Israel, Palestine and the rest of the region who have already recognized Israel could form a new reality and take responsibility for the security of the region collectively. Thank you very much. Uh, Abdallah, um, Abdelaziz, uh, next to you, uh, what is the view from Riyadh? Uh, how are things are looking there? We are looking at the polls and we understand that there is a huge gap between the street and between the uh, intentions of the government to try to use the positive dynamics uh, of, uh, you know, the, this uh, uh, situation right now in order to stabilize the region, in order to put an end to the hostilities. Uh, can it happen in current climate? Um, I think it's uh, the problem or the, the crisis in the region is uh, coming from there is no 
direct talks between the countries and uh, they always needing a mediator, they needing other party, third party. The problem in the region, we not sit together as a, uh, countries and uh, we, ha we, same, we share the same interests, we share the same enemy and we uh, try to avoid a lot of uh, uh, crises. We uh, think about our future and our security in Red Sea and Gulf, Arabian Gulf. We have a common as a countries and the problem is uh, always coming from uh, uh, political Islam in the region. We, if we follow any crisis in the region, we find there is a root of political Islam, not only Sunni and Shia and other. We, uh, in the region, we not fight against the radicals, radicals in Islamic side and the Jewish side. We not focus and have solutions. Um, even the Western power, like United States, our uh, uh, European countries, they not help us. They support political Islam in uh, many times, in many crises. And we, uh, if we go back to 2011, what they call it, uh, uh, Arabian Spring, it came by support from United States, especially in Obama time. And we know the relationship between Muslim Brotherhood, who is the mother of Hamas, with the American department, with the, especially with the Democratic Party. There's a lot of cases, and I think it's because we, we not focus on our problems together. We not talk. We, know how, we don't have a dialogue in the, uh, in the region. That's why we will face more problems. I will not be negative. I will be positive. We, in the final, we will have the peace. No way. We will live together. And from the Saudi prospect, the Saudis and the MPS plan to have uh, uh, 2030, it's focus in the uh, northwest of Saudi Arabia, not far from Israel, on the Red Sea. Without cooperation with Israel, we will not uh, get the full uh, 2030 goals. We will not get it without have a peaceful environment, working together, exchange the sources and especially technology and uh, have uh, investments. We not attract the world to come to uh, Neum or other regions in Saudi Arabia. We focus uh, on it in 2030. That's why the peace and the cooperation with Israel it should be in the table and it will happen, but with a full solution, not part of solution. Full solution is a two-state solution to finish this problem with the Palestinian and with the cooperation from the, uh, cooperation from the Palestinian side to understand the peace is uh, the solution. The war always uh, uh, will, uh, if it continue, we will have no, no goal. And uh, in Saudi prospect, the two-state solution, it will give a lot of uh, hope for the region. But we will see the future. Yes, indeed we will. Uh, and uh, in this regards, Robert, uh, I would like to ask you, you know, it seems that President Biden had put on the table the perhaps, you know, the most intriguing deal uh, uh, during a long, long time. You know, we didn't have such an opportunity to tie everything together, a grand deal. You can get the possibly normalization with Saudi Arabia, but you can also get uh, some uh, stabilization of the Palestinian territories en route to possibly a Palestinian state. Do you think that it's a make or break moment when if we don't take this deal now, it will not be available for us, let's say, for the next 10 years or so even generation time? Or is it something that even if it will not happen now, it will still be available for us at some point later? Uh, it's an excellent question. It's an honor to be here with all of you and to share the stage with uh, distinguished colleagues and my good friend, uh, Yael. I, I would say two things. First is that it is imperative, and it became obvious to us during the negotiation of the Abraham Accords that the overwhelming requirement for countries in the region to integrate with one another from a security and economic perspective is far greater than any threat or any obstacle or any impediment to it. It isn't something that should be done. It is something that must be done. Long-term plans shared across the region require integration with each other. Uh, and this 
demand, I think, drove and manifested in the Accords, and I don't think that that has changed. To your direct question, I would say that it's important to do these things correctly. It's important to do them right. It's important to exercise patience, because if you do make a mistake, it's very difficult to go back and reverse that, especially when you're building trust and confidence with new partners. And last, I would say that the role here, again, in my judgment of the United States is to invest heavily in this process because it is in our best interest and is in the best interest of the region and our partners in it. And that is the animating factor behind it. And I think the degree to which the United States is involved in this and directly lends its full support to our partners and allies in the region, I think you'll see the direct dividend of it. In terms of a grand bargain, I think I would exercise caution and I would focus on those things that are most essential. If you attempt to address the, the full scope of interests all at once, you could overcomplicate the process. We focused on the most important things, the most important things to the countries involved in each case, and that made it possible. And I would recommend and counsel that that is the most logical approach. Interesting. Uh, thank you very much for that. Yeah, the last but not the least, um, how worried are you from the scale of one to 10 uh, from the state of our relations, the state of Israel and the Arab countries. We saw the demonstrations uh, that happened in the night when the hospital uh, in Gaza was bombed. We saw the angry reactions and the polls. And we even heard the Egyptians mentioning the Camp David Accords uh, in regards to the operation in Rafah and the possibility of, well, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, uh, returning the ambassador and even touching on the Accords himself. Uh, how do you feel about it? Um, so first, I'm happy to be last and to welcome all of you, my friends, here to the stage. And Rob, indeed, the things we're able to do together in the past, I think, are a symbol of things that can be done in the future. Look, I think the most important answer is actually sitting on this stage. That the fact that my friend Abdallah and my friend Abdelaziz are here on this stage with us, uh, uh, in an event that is public uh, to the audience, without them or their governments feeling that this is inappropriate, I think gives the most accurate answer to your question. I do not feel worried about the relationship between Israel uh, uh, and the Arab uh, friends and, and the pragmatic countries in the region because, as Rob said, this has become something that is fundamental interests of their national security. Uh, uh, they have recognized that uh, Israel is here to stay long ago, but even more importantly, that there are things, fundamental positive things in relationship with us that are there. Now, of course, there are issues and there will always be issues. Uh, when I accompanied uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Bennett to his visit to Manama, there were protests in the streets, remember? Sure. Yes. Um, uh, and I cannot talk about my visits to Saudi Arabia because I cannot talk about visits to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> but the fact that I can't also say something about the inability to do this uh, uh, publicly. Uh, and this was in good times. So of course now when we have a war that has been uh, going on for 263 days uh, uh, today, uh, uh, this is the case. But I have to tell you, on the first day of the war, I was actually in, uh, in Abu Dhabi in an event. In the evening of the 6th of October, I was there with friends to commemorate three years for the Abraham Accords. It was an amazing evening with Emirati friends and American friends and Israeli friends. And we were talking about the prospect of this to the future, to the future of the region, to the future of Israel. Uh, of course, the day after looked like it was. But being there in Abu Dhabi on October 7, surrounded by people who actually care who understood immediately what was going on and understood immediately who are the bad guys and who are the good guys and who have the right to defend themselves and what is the joint threat to their national security as well. And I'm sure that this sentiment was in all of the other capitals of the pragmatic Arab countries in the region. This is the fundamental thing we need to all to remember, to reside to and to promote as we move ahead. It is a difficult time, it will pass and we will need to bring the bridges back and to build from this relationship because fundamentally it is very strong.
Thank you very much, Yal. And this is a great point, of course, optimistic point. Uh, and uh, of course, I will uh, remind everyone that uh, since the beginning of the war, and we can say, inshallah, uh, not one Arab state uh, uh, cancelled peace treaties and withdrew even ambassadors. Uh, and all of them are in Israel. Uh, and so, of course, the Israeli uh, ambassadors are in Arab capitals. Abdallah, I would like to take your point on the responsibility of the region. Uh, for a long while, you know, region uh, did feel responsible. It felt responsible for the Palestinians in a non-productive way by saying, for example, the triple no to peace, to negotiations in the Khartoum conference uh, in, uh, during the Arab League, 67. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, you're laughing because it was a long time ago, but at the same time, the reality that we are living it was created back then. Uh, perhaps an important opportunity was, uh, you know, missing back then. When you are speaking about possibilities and responsibilities, what exactly do you mean? Do you think that the Arab countries, the pragmatic camp, has now the power uh, and agency to go and put some initiative on the table and say, listen, it's not the Americans that should be, you know, leading with all the respect with the Americans. Uh, it's us, because we live in the Middle East. We are hurt by these wars. We are suffering, you know, from this conflict. And we don't have time. We have to cooperate together for the sake of uh, ecology, uh, uh, you know, uh, working places, better future for our kids. Uh, what do you have in mind, Abdal? Uh, Kassian, let me say this. Uh, I thanked Ian after producing a short uh, video telling him how uh, vivital it is to describe our part of the region as progressive countries instead of calling us moderate Sunnis. Okay, because we are sick and tired of being called moderate Sunnis. We are just normal, regular countries. So please stop calling us Sunnis. Okay. When we talk about interdependency, and, and Rob raised it, and I can assure you, Europe and the States are sick and tired of us mismanaging our efforts. Uh, they want us to take charge of this, okay? So what we need to do, if we're gonna talk about inter interdependency, we need to reverse engineer a lot of approaches. One of them, if you ask me what is the greatest weapon in the Israeli arsenal, I will not tell you it's nuclear stockpile. I will tell you what they did in Negev, because 90% or 99% of the region is deserts. If they can turn the Negev into something as that, with what we are doing at the present time, turning or investing in the green new Middle East, could you imagine replicating that could translate into? What we need more than anything, built on little things. And instead of going for those grand, the minute we go back after this crisis, are we gonna entrench ourselves into Palestinian Israel issue? that's gonna be the end of any process. What we need to do is collectively decide that that has to be achieved. We've heard from Israelis, American, uh, non-American, uh, security and everybody else, saying even if it is, uh, you know, uh, a tough medicine to swallow, everybody will have to share on that. So interdependency need to be translated physically into a workable plan. And the Israelis could do that. But this time, it's not gonna be a through you normalize first and we're gonna do that, no. We, need, we don't need a, a prophecy to take place. We don't need, uh, you know, <clears throat> for the American to tell us what needs to be done. I think it is our Middle East moment, if we fail, to recognize that our priority now is to restabilize the whole region. And I promise you, the European and the American are gonna come in. If, if uh, containing Iran is a challenge, the minute we come together, Iran gonna be put in size. Inspiring, very inspiring. Uh, Abdelaziz, um, I basically want to address the same question also to you. 
Um, and I recently heard from your ambassador in the UK, with whom I had the pleasure to speak at the Chatham House event, uh, that the Airpeace initiative is still on the table. 22 years later, remarkably, it's still on the table. But if it translated to, you know, from words to deeds, um, how far is Saudi Arabia ready to go right now to revive the Arab Peace Initiative and to not only put it on the table, but to really push for it? Because this is what not only Israelis and Palestinians need, this is what the region needs. And uh, again, you know, how popular it in, in Saudi Arabia, maybe we can talk us through uh, that. From private view, uh, I think it's uh, uh, Arab initiative, it's dead. Every country in Arab world, they have their decision, they have their interests, they have, they are not in one position. They, they're not sharing the same uh, view to Israel or to the solution. Everyone work in his agenda and uh, have his, they have their interests and it's different. What their relation with Israel is different. You see uh, how Bahrain and Morocco and Emirates have a deal, Abraham Accord, uh, Saudi Arabia have their interests and they want to have a full solution. They want to bring all of Arabs together to the table with Israel and have a solution if the Israeli and they uh, accept the two-state solution. But in my view, it will not work like this without talking together and straight, without any mediator, without even with respect to the United States. But we are, we living in this region together. We share the same problems. We share the same challenges in the region. Um, I suggest that we should sit together without any limitation, without any uh, barriers. Uh, the problem is we see now what's happening in Red Sea. We have ports in Red Sea, we have a, uh, Egypt, they have um, shortage now of income because the, uh, what happened from Houthi to the uh, marine uh, ships. But, but without, share, without solving the problems, climate change, uh, sharing the technology and uh, our uh, investment challenges, our uh, education, health, many problems we face it in the region together. But we didn't share it. We're just sharing, uh, fighting each other and uh, hate. And we, uh, we need to sit. We need to uh, negotiate through United Nations, through the American, uh, but still uh, without talking together, facing together, have a dialogue together, we will not uh, reach a good point in this region. Hey, Abdelaziz, I have to ask you a very specific question because this is something that is extremely popular in Israeli uh, news shows and talk shows, and then I will go to you, Vial, with the same question. Uh, Arab peacekeeping force uh, that is a very, again, popular issue in Israel, and many Israelis perhaps believe that it's something that the Arabs are dreaming to do and they are ready to just embark on this uh, journey any single day. Do you think that it's possible? Peacekeeping force for Gaza that will combine from uh, Arab uh, uh, armies, uh, soldiers and so on? No, I think the Arab, they will not interfere in this uh, case. This is a problem between Palestinian and uh, Israeli and, and Iranian. Uh, the problem in Iran, the problem start from Iran. The Iran behind all of happened in Gaza. And they, uh, when the American, they should uh, solve the problem and they should solve it with Iran without l limit Iran and interfering in the Arab or in the Gaza or in the, the, the problem. We will not uh, have a solution without it. Why we come to keep a peace for Israel and we don't interfere, we don't uh, create a problem. Why we pay the price? There is United Nations, there is a, a peace, uh, peaceful, uh, peace uh, uh, force in Lebanon, between Lebanon and Israel. Why United Nations not coming to Gaza? And there is a lot of, but to work as uh, Arab countries, to, uh, to be uh, uh, um, uh, in Gaza without uh, solution, solution, 
it not will uh, we have before uh, uh, experience when we uh, send the arab uh, forces to lebanon and then the 70th and uh, what's the result it's very bad result i think solve the problem no between you force. israeli and the palestinian and look to the source of the problem in iran yal uh, do you think that is something that is feasible uh, today First of all, how can we think that something is feasible when uh, people representing, uh, not even, even not officially, but the, the messaging that coming from their countries are telling us that this is not uh, something that we can dream of. Um, uh, and and I, th I have to say, the more I hear uh, our government talking about unrealistic solutions to this problem makes me very, very worried. Because what we should have been doing for months now uh, uh, is to understand that this is not a question of the day after, this is the question of today and of, of yesterday. Uh, uh, if we will not find viable ways uh, to have civilian local governance in Gaza to take care of the humanitarian and, and civilian issues, uh, um, all this will at the end fall on the responsibility of, of the IDF, and Israel does not want that. This is not the, the instructions coming from the government, and this is definitely not something that the IDF should do. We know what will happen. Unfortunately, we're in a situation where this might be the only uh, uh, outcome that is viable because we haven't planned any alternative to it. But I don't want to get into this because this is not the topic of this panel. I do want to say that there are many other things that can and should be done together with our uh, 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 programmatic, progressive friends. Uh, and I want to give an example which I think is very important because uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have decided to completely reform all of the education system and what the people and the students within the kingdom learn about Israel, its presence. It is now something that they are being taught and in a positive way, unlike things that happened in previous years, as we all know. And this has also happened in the United Arab Emirates. And the Bahrainis have been uh, uh, conducting uh, programs of, of de-radicalization of their own population for their own national security interests for many, many years. And there is a lot of experience in those countries. I don't need the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis to come into police in Gaza. This is a war that we need to fight, and we need to take care of the security of our own uh, uh, people. But there's so many other things that can be done. And I have to say that the more I hear that what the government, what the Prime Minister is looking for while normalization with Saudi Arabia is to have the least demands on the Palestinian issue, I say the contrary. No, I want more issues related. I want to harness the capacity and the, and the resources and the motivation and the, and the experience that specifically the Saudis have and their authority in the region as a leader of, 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 uh, uh, of the Arab world uh, uh, to engage in this and to help us solve those issues. Eyal, thank you very much for that. Uh, Robert, uh, Iran was mentioned here, the big, big elephant uh, in the room, the infant terrible of uh, the Middle East. And uh, we see how Iranians terrorizing, certainly us in Israel, uh, and of course their neighbors uh, in the Arab Gulf and other countries, you know, through their proxies and uh, through their maligned, uh, maligned organizations. Um, what is the American role in confronting Iran? in perhaps taming Iran and uh, not allowing it to go along with this plan because we don't hear a lot about Iran, not from, by the way, from the Israeli officials, but also not from the American officials lately. And it seems that indeed we'll have to look at the source of the problem, the root of the problem, which is the Islamic Republic of Iran. There's, there's no doubt about it. And, ha and having spent, as Ayal and others have spent a lot of time invested in this confronting the problem from Iran, it pains me to see the, the, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, and we shouldn't be surprised that chaos follows. They're being allowed access to unlimited resources. That has to stop. Uh, it can be stopped. It has been stopped. It must be stopped again, because what they do with resources is they threaten all of us. All of the surrogates and proxies are dependent upon resources provided by the Islamic Republic. Second, they have to be confronted. Deterrence has to be restored. The problem with uh, a heavyweight boxing champion engaging in a, a combat in Yemen with an unranked, uh, unaffiliated boxer is uh, you've got to win. You cannot lose a fight when you're fighting a, an inferior opponent. Not only is world shipping being diverted, but we are paying for the process. It's costing us now over $2 billion so far, which makes it doubly insulting. 
this has to be addressed. And fundamentally, this is what made the accords and cooperation possible. It's not Iran per se, it's cooperation on dealing with the primary security threat. If you don't take care of first principles, you can't get to second. Gaza is going to be eclipsed by whatever happens in Lebanon, and all comes back to Iran. And so the United States' role in this is to lead an effort to deny them access to resources, to restore deterrence and confront them everywhere they are, and then to work together collaboratively to roll back the axis of resistance. And only then will we be able to live in peace and pursue prosperity. And that's the point. <laughs> it's the Iranians. Um, so, uh, uh, surprisingly, this Middle Eastern panel uh, is uh, absolutely uh, uh, on time. Uh, our time uh, is uh, running up. Uh, I would like to say just that uh, this whole, you know, just the other said, uh, like Eyal said, uh, this panel of uh, uh, Israelis and uh, Bahrainis and Saudis and Americans, uh, the mere fact that it's taking place in Israel today, uh, it's a win. It's a win for peace, it's a win for pragmatism, and it's, uh, it's a win for moderation and for life itself. So I think applause are in order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shalom and salam.